But I thought about Buddha and how he struggled with words. And I thought of Jesus and the parables, that he used the parables. His way of using words was stories so that you could get the whole view, however you wanted to interpret the story. And I wondered if parables have a, a way of going through any generation and the storyline, which made me think of the golden rule, some of the adages that we have that no matter what religion or what generation or where you live or who you are, we all honor the gold. We all seem to honor the golden rule. Are those a part of our mythology? Is that what you're, is that what we're trying to talk about as a part of our mythology? Some of the time, time tested things, Michael, is that, do you think that's part of our mythology? Well, you know, the, first of all, um, part of this journey we're sharing is a journey in appreciating the severe and perhaps absolute limitation of human language. Mm -hmm. so that's right. the first thing. And, and to your point about Jesus, uh, Mr. Kier Mr. Kierkegaard points out that uh, the only time that Jesus ever wrote anything uh, that at least is recorded, the only time he ever wrote anything, he wrote it in the sand. So um, mm -hmm. if you check your New Testament, that is correct. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that sort of says something. Now, yes, um, Jesus always communicated in parables, or as we would talk about that today, in metaphors or in, 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 in myth, in stories. And we've got to do that again. And of course, what Mr. Campbell uh, has uh, communicated today in, in today's material is that uh, the old, the, yes, the old do not work. The old myths, the old stories do not work, however, and while he did not know what the new myth was going to look like, he was very clear that the first thing it had to be was global. So whatever, whatever we're going to uh, evolve as a new story, a new myth, it must be global, it must be diverse, it must be in total harmony with quantum, a quantum scientific worldview, which is the worldview that we all share whether we wish to acknowledge it or not, or whether we have any idea what it means or not. The fact that we're looking at each other on these screens says <laughs> we're, willing, we're willing to use it even if we don't understand it. And um, so the new story must be, must be um, a global, it must be diverse, it must uh, be in harmony with a quantum scientific worldview, and um, it must be a way that you can talk with your grandchildren um, or your neighbor's grandchildren or the teenager on the street. And, and so while this may seem abstract, it really isn't. And it has to do with we want to have a deep conversation with our neighbor or anybody or as we discussed last time, you know, when I have to talk to my granddaughter about what happened to her kitty who only made it halfway across the street, um, we have to not cop out and immediately go to the old language. We have to figure out how do I talk about this today in language that is um, universal, is um, uh, honoring of, of diversity of everybody. And um, how do I do that? And, and we all have the, pra the opportunity to practice that every day. And of course, at a deep level, we have to start with ourselves. So when I talk to myself about the deep stuff, I connect with whatever the deep center is I connect with, What's the language I'm using to do that? Well, that's that's where we start. And so um, anyway, that and that was precisely the focus of life journey number three, which I won't elaborate on right here. But uh, yes, these are these things are highly integrated. I'm not to sound flippant because I'm not. But in the majority of cases, 
I would find myself, if I'm going to be explicit, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I want to know. I have some beliefs, but I don't really know. Um, and, and many scientists would say, for many things that we see happening, I don't know why. It's hard to come up with the language other than I don't know to explain what I don't know. Well, well what, what great language. See, that you see right now you, are, you and I are experimenting with the new myth. And it starts with the language of not knowing. I don't know. I'd like to jump in here. Um, there is something unknown in reality. And that reality that is unknown is unknown unknown. But then we have an experience where we, where was, what was unknown is now known. <laughs> and when that is known, then you can describe, as the Buddhist um, monks that we watched described, you have to have words for that experience. And they are got to be fragile and limited just because we are broken and limited. At the same time, they're pointing to a wholeness, uh, an inclusiveness, as Michael was just referring to. Freedom is dreadful. But I think we're experiencing, I go out in the woods and try to trim ivy off of trees. It's totally overwhelming. That's all I want to say. Anyone else, um, a question you'd like to process or Go out to the group or other insights. Michael, I have a question. This is Teresa. Yes, Teresa. You know, when I when I when I tuned into the first story and you know the myth between the myths, in in my experience, I feel like I live in between all of the time. And it's like, no matter what I um, believe in, like whether it's a scientific experiment that, you know, leads to a quote, causal relationship um, or not, that those scientific relationships change. And we, we know that, you know. So even the facts and the, and the truths that we believe are true now, like the things I used to believe from experiences I've had and knowledge I've gained and things I've observed. Now, if I experienced those again, I would not have the same experience. So everything is always building, you know, and expanding. So in my mind, I'm curious about, I, I, because I don't know where this is going, is it's like we're, we're wanting to achieve a new myth but then that even that myth will become irrelevant, you know? So I'm just curious about, I guess, where, where this leads. And is the focus on the new myth or is the focus on living with that? Because I think that honoring where we've been as far, and also honoring where we're going and where we will continue to go is really important and vital. And, you know, I just wonder, I have a lot of, you know, curiosity about that. Certainly. Well, Teresa, good, good question. And, and the purpose of the, and, 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 and that, that's an excellent question because the purpose of the new myth is not to create a new myth. 
the, the purpose of the new myth is the same as the purpose of the old myth, which is to push us beyond myth, to point us beyond myth to, um, and where does it want to deliver us? Well, the reason for all religion, the reason for all uh, myth throughout human history has not been in order to beat each other over the head by whatever new myth we came up with. The purpose has always been to deliver us, if the stuff is real, into our lives, to deliver us into authentic life, to deliver us into the, the living of our lives, the experience of our experience. Um, that's the purpose. What, do, what does authentic living look like, feel like, smell like? How do I live an authentic life today? That's the only reason to have any myth or any story or any religion is to live a life. And um, so the reason we have to keep coming up with new ways to talk about uh, whatever it is that we need to deliver us into our real lives is because science changes, history changes, bodies change, uh, everything changes. And so this is a perpetual process. And the problem is that right now we have been divorced from authentic living for per perhaps, you know, 400 years since we crawled into our heads and thought we were gonna find all the answers in being real rational in science and whatever. But the, the fact is that um, uh, an awakenment began about 180 years ago an awakenment to uh, authentic living. And that's what we started last week with Mr. Kierkegaard. Mr. Campbell today, you know, continued to take us on that journey. And the next four sessions will continue to build on those. But the point is not to have another new myth, although we need a new myth right now. And it's very important. Um, uh, the point is, how do I live a life? And moreover, how do I help evolve the tools so that my uh, children and my grandchildren and the next generation can live a life of depth, uh, live a life connected to uh, the ultimate center that has always been the ultimate center and always will be the ultimate center and is far beyond words that any of us will ever create. Hey, Michael. Okay. Hey, Mary. You should read what Richard McKay just wrote to everyone All on right. the chat. Or I could read it to you if you no, want. Please, please do. I see it, but please, please read it. Okay. He said, um, using fresh language to talk about the new mythology. Yeah, I hear that difficulty. Living in the Bible Belt and finding the new language to talk to them try to talk to most anyone. They don't begin with the experience. They begin with the little, literal interpretation. And Jesus is somewhere up above for many of the people here. I think people here are still living in an old time frame, actually. Yeah, I can say more about that. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to talk to people because, uh, yeah, they, uh, people that go to church, well, the pastor says, you know, life is like this. So, you know, um, they're going back to an old time when things were comfortable. So anything comes up, oh, I got to appeal to this God in the sky or, you know, something out of reality. Um, I don't know. That's how I see it. And so people, there's people that I know that believe it, it's all one, you know, oneness, uh, quantum theory, but try to talk to that, to some of the religious people around here. <laughs> They're like, you know, this is blasphemy or something. You know, the, they think of, some of them think of the internet as evil. It's really incredible. I, I'm not from the Bible Belt, so... <laughs> Anyway, that's my uh, interpretation. So, yeah, um, I think it is about finding language that will get through to some of these people 
when they come up with, well, Jesus will help me, you know, it's like, right, you know, how do I, how do I reinterpret that in a conversation with someone like that? Does that make sense? Yes. It's, it's um, yeah, when I, I remember when I went to Indonesia and people there were in a different technology time. All of the technology that we had in the United States was still coming there. And it's like here, they're in a different time frame. I, I don't know how to say that, but they're not in the present. They're not living in the present. Richard, yeah. I have had a, um, a conversation with a sister that is fundamentalist. Yeah. And we're starting with questions like with each other, like, who is God? Where is God? Yeah. Um, just, and, just, and those simple questions are really interesting, the back and forth. But it, I think it creates a commonness between us. Um, just because we see it differently um, doesn't mean that there's got to be a divide. And um, so it's, yeah. it's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, starting with the basics, it's like you're t uh, two grades or five grades ahead of them, but we're in the same school. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, you know, yeah. They're, they're wanting... They're wanting uh, the peace and everything. So. One of the things I said in our group was that we, it's like we're all part of an orchestra and everyone's playing a different instrument. And together we can play beautiful music if we all respect each other and play the, kind of the same tune, uh, unified in, in what we're going for, which is God or love or whatever it is. And as long as we can get in harmony with each other, we don't have to agree. We can be different instruments. Um, and we need to respect the differences. And it, I think it works better. And so people that are fundamentalists, I think, have a place. And in the peacefulness of, of their, some of the people I know that are fundamentalists are so peaceful about what they believe, I don't want them to change. Because what they offer to the world is their love at their level. And I think that's great. Yeah, I, I'm in, I, I, I truly believe that too. I think that that's, I think that instrument um, idea is a really good one, Jeannie. And um, that is, I think what we should be doing is breaking down barriers and trying to find where we connect, you know, those intersections. Yep. Yep. I wonder if uh, science isn't actually a distraction many people look at science as gonna answer these unanswerable questions. When maybe the simple answer is, we need to truly live the life we live and venerate that life, those experiences, more than we're looking for science to give us the answer to what is already in our everyday life. Yeah. Yes. I think we know when we have good interactions during the day, when we appreciate what is in our day, we have a better day than if we're thinking science is going to explain God to us. That's not going to happen. Yeah, I think some scientists uh, have their own form of dogma and they're kind of set in their ways, you know, uh, too, just like the church used to have. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, like science is religion. Science is a religion also, yeah. You know, one thing that I've seen here, I mean, Richard, I can relate to what you're saying because I just moved back here from uh, Maryland and it's much different there. And I came back here <laughs> And uh, I was born here, you know, raised here, and I just have been kind of shocked. Uh, uh, Narrow-mindedness. And have had conversations with um, childhood friends who are very fundamentalist and have talked to them about reaching out to especially the youth today because 
many of the youth are turning away from religion, from right. churches, from, you know, organized um, communities like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, searching on Facebook for answers. And so I, I can relate to what you're saying. And one thing that has been really um, useful is talking about God's will, because a lot of them um, believe in God's will. And I ask them, how do you know what God's will is? And that's been a really good tool, too. I like what you said, Mary, about what, who is God and where is God. Um, but, you know, they're very strong into God's will. And so how do you know that? Well, reading the Bible. But for you personally, you know, what is God's will for you in your life? That's what I'm searching for. And how do you find that? And that's been a really opening um, kind of conversation. Well, it's all I, Because I believe that God's will is your will when you're at your fullest and highest potential. So... And you're in your joy and in your, your happiness and peace. So if that's the case, uh, then that's what you really need to find. And how do you find that? That is through finding peace in your community, in your, your relationships and in your life, in your personal self, you know, loving yourself, accepting yourself and loving others and accepting others as well. So that, that to me, you know, is like the manifestation of God's will for our life. You know, if we were going to talk about it as if God has a will for us, which is very strong with the fundamentalist population. Yes, yes. Well, this is very helpful. A good, good exchange. Um, we all, um, and certainly we can walk into any bar and start using the old language and immediately start a fight. Um, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, and, and so this is probably a, a good motivation for all of us this next week to go practice using the language of experience, however that shows up, uh, that we all share. And um, once upon a time, amazingly enough, all this language that we now fight over was supposed to be uh, language to help us connect with the wholeness, with the oneness, with our commonness, yeah. universal. Uh, well, uh, that's our job again today.